Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. What is the special court for Sierra Leone? How do the actions of the court impact people in the United States and around the world? We will be back in just a moment to talk about these and other hot button issues. Welcome back to Global Connections Television. Today we're going to focus on a, a small country in Africa. Many of the countries in Africa are quite large. They're having some very major problems, but there's one small country that had a civil war not too long ago, and the aftermath of that is being dealt with right now, and that's what we're going to focus on today, the special court for Sierra Leone. My guest today is Steve Rapp, and Mr. Rapp is an American lawyer who has been the chief prosecutor at the Special Court for Sierra Leone since December 2006. In 2005, he became the chief of prosecutions at the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. Prior to that, from 2001 on, he was involved in the prosecutions of the famous media trial. Mr. Rapp has been a member, a Democratic member, of the Iowa House of Representatives in the United States. Steve Rapp, welcome to today's yes. Global Connections program. I'm glad to be here, Bill. Mr. Prosecutor, I appreciate you being with me today. Mm -hmm. Now, we're going to talk about, uh, kind of flash back, mm -hmm. to, uh, or talk about some of the horrific things that happened in Sierra Leone. Very shortly, we'll be talking about what you're doing as special prosecutor. But let's start off on a positive note and maybe give a little overview to our viewers about what is going on today in Sierra Leone. Not too many years ago, there, were, there, were, uh, there was a lot of mutilation that was taking place, killings, civil war was underway, but what is going on in the country today that's happening that's positive? Well, peace has returned to Sierra Leone since 2002, and, and remarkably in, in 2007 there was an election uh, in which the opposition won, and uh, their, their, their victory was certified, there was a change of power uh, without, any, without any lethal violence in that society. It was, a, it was a great event. Uh, it, it's also a, a, a wonderful country to, to work in. Uh, it has a tradition, as you know, uh, it was established by freed slaves really at the end of the, of the 18th century. Uh, it has the first in, uh, university in sub-Saharan Africa for a big college. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a vibrant uh, country, but it went through a, a horrendous war with, uh, with more than a third of the population displaced, with uh, uh, tens of thousands of people murdered, with the uh, amputations of, of hands and, and, and ears and, and, and other limbs and, uh, and a tremendous amount of sexual violence and, and the use of children as, as, as soldiers. But uh, uh, that's now come to an end. Uh, we're part of the process of establishing justice and telling the story about what happened there. But uh, I think we've got a situation where uh, it's, it's not likely that this kind of horrendous uh, criminal activity will recur in the future. Mm -hmm. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Sierra Leone is one of the smaller African countries. It's about as big as the state of South Carolina in the United States. It has about six and a half million people. But as you mentioned, such a large number of the population was affected by the horrific civil war. <coughs> excuse me, civil war that was taking place. What were the years of the civil war, and who were some of the key players in that particular? setting? Well, the war began in 91 uh, and, and ended in 2002. Uh, uh, really, some of the toughest part of the Civil War occurred uh, 
uh, after a military coup in, in, in 1997 when the elected government was overthrown and, and the rebels uh, were invited into power. Uh, together we're in a government uh, with a, a military junta uh, that was sort of the worst government ever uh, for eight months. Uh, it was removed by West African peacekeepers, but then went in, uh, the rebels and, and those that involved in that government went into the bush and continued uh, the war to try to get the power back, and, and particularly in that period of, of 1998, uh, committed tremendous atrocities uh, across the country that had operations with names like No Living Thing or Operation Spare No Soul. It had been bad beforehand, but it was worse, and, and it culminated uh, in, in terms of atrocity and, and finally visibility of the, of the world on the 6th of January 1999 when the capital of Freetown was invaded. Uh, by the rebels and their former uh, allies in the junta, and uh, and you had uh, rape and murder and amputation before the eyes of the world until uh, the, they were pushed out. But then the war continued. Uh, there was an attempted peace plan where people were given amnesty, but that broke down. The, the rebels didn't disarm. They actually went out and captured peacekeepers, and there were some peacekeepers that were killed, hundreds of others that were, were taken hostage, and it was only uh, with the United Nations peacekeeping force coming in with a with a smaller British intervention uh, that it was finally possible to, uh, uh, for the war to come to an end in, in, in 2001 and for the democratic process uh, to return. The intriguing thing about the war in Sierra Leone is unlike the Rwandan conflict in which I was involved in the prosecution of those responsible for the Rwanda genocide, you did have this, this element of, of ethnic conflict. And in the former Yugoslavia, you've got a, to some extent a religious conflict. But in Sierra Leone, there wasn't that element. And uh, many Sierra Leoneans, and, and we in the prosecution, tend to view this as a, as a situation where some people at least said that there were grievances and they started a rebellion, uh, but they didn't really have much popular support. But they made up for it by con committing horrendous atrocities, by essentially murdering a lot of people, raping other people, kidnapping children, intimidating people to such an extent that everyone would cower in fear, and, and then particularly this use of child soldiers, because you can, uh, you can take a 15-year-old, 14-year-old, 13-year-old, 12-year-old, have him do horrible things uh, to his family, give him drugs, break down all of his uh, the, the, the sort of family control there, and he can end up doing worse crimes. Than, uh, than, than adults can, and can be a sort of a willing tool, and uh, even though he's not someone that uh, really is responsible for his own acts. And, and that element, I think, made it possible for the war to continue for a, for a long time, uh, but without, uh, without really any, any basis in popular support, because at the end of the war, when the, when the rebels formed a political party, practically nobody voted for them. So that was the end of them. <laughs> yeah, all well, I mean, they're, they're, well, in, they're in, still around in terms of political support. Exactly. But right. uh, but certainly we obviously have the question of having having tried the the sort of amnesty approach in '99 and then having the killing and the raping and uh, going on. Uh, that in, in 2000, uh, the elected government actually asked the United Nations for the establishment of a court to judge those who bore the greatest responsibility for these atrocities. And they wanted something different than the Yugoslavia or the Rwanda court. They wanted a, a, a partnership between the United Nations and the, and the, and the national uh, judicial system, a, a situation where some of the judges would be appointed nationally, some would be appointed internationally, where the prosecutor would be international, the deputy prosecutor be appointed by the president of the country, where you'd actually have the justice in country, not uh, is in the case of the Rwanda tribunal over in Tanzania or in the case of Yugoslavia in, in the Netherlands, but, but right there. And, and that you would also make use of, of Sierra Leoneans uh, in, in all the various aspects of investigation and security and, and outreach for the, for the court and, and, and the legal and judicial and investigative process. And so uh, that's, I think, made the, our court a whole lot closer to the public. On the other hand, it's, uh, it's, it has this limited mandate. Uh, it, back in 2002, there were some who were complaining that the other courts were prosecuting too many mid-level or lower-level individuals. Uh, they told us very explicitly, you only go after the, uh, only after the leaders. And as a result, my predecessor uh, basically indicted uh, only 13 people uh, who were uh, leaders of, of one of each of one of the three groups uh, responsible for the greatest number of atrocities during the conflict. 
Uh, we've now completed uh, the trials of the leaders of the first two groups. The, the third group, uh, that uh, uh, trial in Freetown has now concluded. We're expecting a judgment uh, uh, very soon, maybe by the time of this airs, the, the judgment of the RUF will have been announced. And then our most famous trial is, is someone that we allege was essentially the most powerful influence or the most powerful uh, controlling force of the RUF, and that was Charles Taylor, the president of the neighboring uh, Republic of Liberia, uh, who has been indicted by our court and uh, eventually was arrested and under, uh, pursuant to the request of regional leaders, it was decided that his trial, rather than happening in Freetown, the capital of Sierra Leone, as is the case with most of our trials, all of our trials except his, uh, his trial was to be moved elsewhere, but still conducted by our court, by our personnel. And so we're, we're trying him at The Hague uh, at the courtroom, in the courtroom of the International Criminal Court. So some people say, oh, the ICC is doing that. No, it's which, not. Which it's, we're it's going us. to get into in just it's a moment. I, that's a good point.